Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. It's all of our needs according to yeah. the riches of glory by yeah. Christ Jesus. And uh, we, uh, 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 as you prepare your offering, uh, you can also give your offering online. I know that people are watching tonight. Uh, on your mobile device, you can give cash or check. Amen. They can't give cash. You can give cash out here. But they have to give check. Or you can text your offering to 732-856-5050. You can tell them to text. I'm learning now. I'm getting better. Amen. Or visit us at www.abundantgracechurch.com. And we appreciate you partnering with us yes. in, the, uh, in the spreading of the gospel. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, let's uh, pray and thank, thank God you, for a good offering tonight. Amen. Amen. Father, every offering is a good offering because we yes. give it from our heart, Lord, and we thank you, Father, that as we sow our seed, Father, you meet every need that we have Amen. according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus, Father. The church's needs and our needs, Father. Amen. And uh, as we give, Lord, we, give, we you see our heart because uh, that's where our treasure is yeah. in you, Lord Jesus. And so bless the people tonight as they give and bless this church, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Receive the offering. Praise God. In the name of the Lord is my strong tower. The righteous run into and they are saved. Sunday or Wednesday, I'm usually down there. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why I'm up here tonight, because I'm afraid you're not going to like me after tonight's over. <laughs> Just so you know, but you'll like me tomorrow, because God's word is true. Amen? Amen? If you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 26, and before we get started, let's pray. Yeah. Father God, we thank you for an opportunity to come here tonight, Lord. We thank you that we have this place, the church, Father. We know that we are the church. We meet in this building, but we are grateful for it, Father. Yeah. We're grateful for your word, Father. We thank you that everybody has supernatural ears to hear your word tonight, a heart that's receptive, that it would take root in each and every one's hearts and produce in their lives. And we thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, Amen. and everyone said, Amen. Amen. So, if you like the title, now your head's going to go somewhere, but it's not where you think it is. The title of the message tonight is, I'm P.O.'d. Okay. Got it? Not what you think it is. We're going to get there in a second. Um, it's difficult at times to do a message like this. I'll be quite honest with you. This was not the message I had prepared. Uh, for you guys who don't know this, but me, Pastor shares a preaching schedule with me and Pastor Eddie. And I knew I was preaching tonight, and I had a great message. It was going to be all about leaving your past in the past. And God said, nope, that's not what you're doing. You're doing this. And I don't want to do this. Because the last time I did this, I had, it was a Sunday. I'll never forget it. It was a couple years ago. After the service, two people came up to my wife and said, I'm leaving the church. How dare your husband talk about me? <laughs> but I realized that some of the best messages I ever heard, or the best message you'll ever hear, is one that is directed right at you. And not the ones that feel comfortable, good, and make you all ushy-gushy inside. It's the ones that make you squirm in your seat that facilitate change. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So I'm going to preface this by saying this type of message has, a, has an opportunity to invoke those feelings that I want to minister about to try to facilitate change in your life. So don't let that happen. Mm -hmm. 
And number two, I'm saying this in advance. I don't know where each and every person is at here. I know where I'm at. And this ministers to me as much as it ministers to you. So I want to preface this all by saying I'm talking to nobody and everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay? Fair enough? Mm -hmm. So we have some ground rules? Yeah. All right. Amen. Mm -hmm. So what I'm talking about, I'm PO'd. I'm talking about I'm prideful and I'm offended. Mm. And this is the season. Right? We're right smack dab in the middle of the holiday season. And as much as we as Christians want to keep Christ in Christmas, the world says that's not what it's about. And, you know, we go out with a good heart to let's go shopping and we're going to bless people. And, and they're not happy. And people working in the mall are not happy. And people are nasty and angry and mean. And you don't have to look much further than social media to real, realize the whole world is full of pride and offended. And we can't allow ourselves to get caught up in that. Amen? Amen? So let's take a look at a couple things. Let's look at what is the regular Webster's Dictionary definition of pride. And pride defined as a, a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements. Say, my own achievements. My own achievements. The achievements of those with whom one is closely associated or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired. Every time I read that definition, I always think about us having pride in our children. But if that's, that's splitting hairs sometimes. Are we, are we happy for our children's accomplishments and we, we take, you know, we t we're invested in that? Or are we, thank, are we puffing up ourselves saying, I'm the reason for my children's accomplishments? Mm -hmm. That's the pride side. To be happy for what your children have accomplished and realizing you had a part in that and genuinely think that's awesome, to me is not pride. It's pride saying they're there because of me. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I want to talk about kids, but I always think about that when I think about having pride in our children, right? Mm -hmm. Pride at times, if not all the time, is really a mask for us. It's a mask for us trying to control whatever situation you're going through in your own strength. Amen? Amen. Pride is also a distortion of our own insecurities. It's a mask of protection. And the reason why I don't like to give this message for what I've already mentioned, part two is I was the most prideful, arrogant, self-centered, offended person on planet Earth years ago. My wife, I don't want to look at her, but she can attest to that. You know, I knew her four years before we started dating. The reason why she would never date me, although I wanted to, was I like him. He's fun to hang out with. You know, we always have, you know, we always enjoy ourselves, but he is the most prideful cuss on planet Earth. Yeah. Right? Am I lying? No. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's true. Hey, it's true. I got to own it, right? But it reminds me. It reminds me that I always have to keep my own pride in check as well. And the reason why I was so prideful is I was so full of insecurities. The pride that I portrayed was false pride. But I used whatever thing was positive in my life or what I thought I had it all together in to mask those insecurities. And don't say for one second, Christians, don't do it as, as well. We're going to look at that as we get into this tonight. We, I hope that we're going to finish. I can't guarantee it. If not, we'll finish it the next time. Um, so really, pride is selfish. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's all about us, right? Mm -hmm. Let's look at the biblical. Let's look at the Webster's um, definition of offense or offended. Annoyance or resentment brought about by a perceived insult to or disregard for oneself or one's standards or principles. Basically, this is what offense does. Offense judges. It makes a decision based on what we perceive someone about someone or what somebody's done to us. So we're, we're judging people when we're offended many times. Now, I'm not, we're going to get into what happens when people come against us. But offense judges and makes a decision based on what we perceive about someone or something else uh, that somebody or something that somebody's done to us. Both of these things, pride and offense, are completely, totally rooted in being selfish. And like I said, we don't have to look really too much further than social media. You know, I, I really have taken like a pretty, pretty significant fast from things like Facebook because everybody's angry about everything. And they're using like regular platforms to 
get their anger across. You know, I, I follow Monmouth County News because I was born and raised in Monmouth County. It's only been a year since me and Jody were down in Ocean County. And people are posting everything political under the sun. Trump did this, Nancy Pelosi did that. And they're arguing 400 comments about, and I'm really like, I don't care. God's still on the throne. If Nancy Pelosi is almost there as Speaker of the House, that's a God-ordained position, whether you voted for her or not. We couldn't, because she's not in our district. But my point being is, just shut up. Amen. You're engaging in a fight you can't win. And that's what pride and offense do. Let's look at a couple of biblical folks here and really kind of look at it from God's perspective. I said Matthew 26. We're going to start in verse 31. Really, you guys should be familiar with who I'm about to talk about, because he was a prideful person. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never stumble. <laughs> and Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you that, that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Newsflash, Peter was the prideful guy, right? We know that. He walked and talked with Jesus. He was physically in Jesus' ministry, yet he dealt with pride. What's to exclude us as Christians from dealing with pride? Let's look at Peter one more time. This is we're actually I'm moving over to Mark chapter 8, verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine if Jesus showed up in this church service right now and you said, Jesus, you're wrong. You're doing it wrong. He walked and talked with Jesus. He saw everything Jesus did. Then had the prideful audacity to say, you're wrong. <laughs> right? And we know what Jesus did, right? <laughs> he, he, he spoke this word openly. Peter took him, aside, uh, took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, Peter saying, get behind me, Satan. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. I don't want Jesus to say, Satan, get behind me, to me. Amen? Why is this? Jeez, Peter thought Jesus' way wasn't good enough. His way was better. You might say, I'd never do that. I'd never confess what Peter confessed, and I would never deny you. Right? Or I would never think my way is better than Jesus. But every time we take control of our situation... Rather than do it God's way, we're just being prideful. Yeah, right. Amen? Yeah, amen? We're not being obedient or willing to do what God's telling us to do. Pride will be, if you get something out of this tonight, this statement, I'm going to read it exactly out of my notes because I don't want to mess it up. Pride is more concerned about the things of man or the world rather than the things of God. Pride is selfish and the things of God are selfless. What is the motivation behind everything you do? And we're going to look at this tonight. And we're also going to look at it specifically, we get there hopefully, pride inside the local church. Amen. What about Peter? We just said he was also, he saw, he was prideful, but he was also easily offended. We know the story. Jesus is, 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 is with the disciples. And, uh, well, let, let's read it. I wasn't going to read this for the sake of time, but let's read it. Uh, John chapter 21, verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus had said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more, more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lamb. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said 
He had said this to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you gird yourself and walk where you wish. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. But what does Peter do? Jesus just told him, this is what's going to happen. Follow me, though. I got your back. I, you know, I, we've got this together. When he's saying, follow me, right? But what does Peter do? He turns around, looks at John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and, and let's read it. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? What about this guy? Forget about me. What about him? Because uh -huh. why Jesus said to him, if you will remain till I come, what's that to you? Right. Well, if that's, if that's what John's going to do, if John's going to die of old age and be like the only apostle that dies or disciple that dies of old age, i got a problem with that. I'm offended by that. What about him? Amen. This is Peter. Yeah. Why would we be exclusive from, you know, or totally exempt from pride and offense? Amen. You know, thank God Jesus actually restored him. Follow me. He restored him. And Jesus is in the restoration business. And thank God for that, too. Because I want you guys to look inward tonight at what you're dealing with. Just like when I put the message together, I've got to deal with my own pride from my past. I've got to deal with me being offended at times. Because I don't know one minute, well, I shouldn't say that. I don't personally know a minister or pastor who wouldn't possibly get offended. Why? Because we're human beings. Amen. You know, I want to look at that as we get into looking at pride and offense inside the, the local church. Pride and offense are complete and total blessing blockers. Huge. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read over here. I'm just gonna sum this up. Over in 2 Kings chapter 5, you guys remember the story of Naaman's leprosy? Yes. Naaman um Naaman was a leper. He was also a mighty warrior. He was like the ultimate general, um, you know, in Syria. He knew warfare, but the bottom line, he, he was he was a leper. So he winds up going to Elijah's house because a little girl told him, you know, there's the, there's the, you know that, that prophet of the Lord over there. He's got some stuff going on. Naaman goes, I'll go there. Shows up. Elijah sends out his servant, and what happens to Naaman? Does he know who I am? Does he know I command armies? This is me talking 2018. Does he know who I am? He sends his servant? Yeah, go dip in the Jordan seven times, the leprosy will be gone. Long and the short of it, he finally obeyed. But Naaman almost lost his healing because he was offended. That guy is beneath me. He probably actually thought Elijah was beneath him. But I'm going to go check it out anyway, because i got to get rid of this leprosy. He was just going. I don't know that to be factual, but think about it. He had that attitude. In those days, warriors were the thing. You know, they were the deal. They're the ones who were like the big shots, right? And this guy almost loses his healing because of his pride and offense. So what does offense do? We just looked at Naaman almost losing his healing because of his offense. Offense does this. Offense gets angry, it makes a snap decision, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's a wrong one, and, it's, and pride stops you from making it right or rectifying the situation. I know I said we're going to talk about pride and offense inside the local church. Every time I read that in my notes, I can instantaneously, I have flashes of people's that I know personally that used to come to this church that run through my head and they've left for all the stupidest reasons. And I know in my heart of hearts that they're supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. I preached Sun another Sunday morning message. I don't know why things were a little interesting. But Pastor was away. Pastor Eddie was here. And I had come in to preach, and I didn't. I knew we were working on the platform in the old, well, the gym then. And the platform was all rearranged, and I was the first one to preach in that new platform. 
And what we also had done, we had taken one big, two separate middle sections and combined them into one big middle section and then two side sections. People went nuts. Where's my seat? It's not in the middle aisle. What am I going to do? I got to leave the church. My seat. Where is it? Just like craziness. We get so bent out of shape and offended at so many little things. And then that may, we get angry, we make a decision, and pride stops us from coming back and making it right. That's what offense does. All right, so you're ready to take a little journey, pride and offense, within, within the local church? Because it happens. And the reason why I wanted to specifically talk about this tonight, again, I'm an observer by nature. I see things going on around here. And again, not any of you. I don't know where your hearts are. I don't know, you know, I don't know this is what you need. I know it's what I need. It's a reminder. But I see and I hear people say things. And we're, you know, we're in the end of the end times right now, right? And we have a commission that we have to fulfill. We need to win people over to Jesus. We need to get people saved. And we're too busy fighting amongst ourselves, getting hurt and offended and worrying about just us. We're not going to accomplish that. Jesus will find somebody else that will, but it's on us. Amen. So this is why I wanted to look at it inside the local church. And I, I always have some, some tests that I use for you to determine, and me to determine, <laughs> where our heart's at. Now, what, and as I actually thought of you tonight as I was driving over here, what would you do right now if Pastor Carol came up to you and said, hey, do me a favor, can you clean that toilet? Did he just ask me to do that? Did he ask me to clean the toilet? Anthony Rack on Sunday, we finally announced him as a new elder here at the church. Amen. He's probably done more toilet cleaning time, him and Angela, than any person that's ever walked through Amen. these doors. Because that job, and well, everything else he does, of course, but that job is as important as every other job here. Amen. But if Pastor asks you today, do me a favor, clean that toilet. What should our answer be? Yeah. No problem. Absolutely. Not a, I know I have. Do I enjoy cleaning toilets? I'll get a little skewed out, I'll be honest. But I'm going to clean it. Why? Because he answered. He asked me to. And that's what you know, this a little, little extra is, if you want to be in a position of authority, you can't be unless you know how to submit to authority. Amen. Right? Amen. What about our soup kitchen here? If you ever volunteered at our soup kitchen, these people don't necessarily look like us, they don't act like us, or they don't even smell like us. So what? I can't go in that soup kitchen and feed people. They smell. They don't smell good. Where would Jesus be? Would he be saying, hey, I got this big ministry. You know, I got 5,000 people on this hill, plus the, plus the women and children. There's like 10,000 people I'm preaching to. I'm not no time for a smelly soup kitchen. Where would he be? At the smelly soup kitchen. Is he going to hang out with the 99? Or is he going to leave the 99 to get the one? Right? And I'll tell you what. Some of those people don't smell good, don't look like us. They're a little disheveled. But they minister to us. Right? Amen? Here's another one. What do you do? This is a big one. Sometimes I think Christians are more guilty of this. What do you do when you leave the sanctuary and sister so-and-so who's going through something walks away from you? Do you turn to each other and start <laughs> gossip? Gossip. You know when gossip stops? When it meets one obedient Christian. Right. That's when gossip stops. Right. Why, why is gossip a form of pride at times? Because gossip is trying to talk you into your situation being better than what you're talking about to that person. You know, you know, we know that we know the scripture about the um, the Pharisee and the tax collector, false humility, right? Yeah. Thank God I'm not like this tax collector over here. Do you know what Sister So and So did? Mm -hmm. I would never do that. Yeah. Same thing Peter did, right? Right. Gossip predispositions about people. It is so dangerous to let somebody whisper in your ear an opinion they have of somebody you've never met. This happened to me 
two occasions here at the church. I'm going to use Louis as an example. It wasn't Louis. Somebody came up to me and told me about a guy inside the church. Uh, and I entertained it. I was not there yet. I didn't know enough to say, I don't want to hear it and walk away, which I will do now. Right? And I entertained it. They gave me this story about so-and-so, and I had it all built up in my head. I never met him. And then finally I met him. He was like the nicest guy in the world. They had a problem with him. They were offended by this guy. And I allowed myself to judge him before I ever knew him, and I should never judge, because somebody gave me a predisposition, an idea of who or what he was before I ever met him. Mm -hmm. That's offense. Mm -hmm. I got offended by a guy through a story somebody told me that I didn't even know was true. Mm -hmm. yeah. That guy had a problem with him. I should have just been like Switzerland and be like, I don't want to hear it. Which I do try to endeavor to do now. Amen. Here's another thing inside the church. Pride in areas of service. Don't think for one second this doesn't happen in churches everywhere. I'm more talented than so and so. Why are they there instead of me? Do you guys realize that service? We talked about toilets. I think I used this in a message a couple weeks ago. Your path to the pulpit may come through cleaning the bathroom. I started here cooking every other week for the Celebrate Recovery Ministry, and the only reason that happened is Jody and Linda at the time were just too afraid to ask Pastor if we could have food. He's like, you get along with Pastor, ask him. I'm like, yeah. Service is an act. It's true. Service is an act of worship and should be done in real humility and reverence for the honor to serve. Amen. Not look at what so-and-so did wrong, right, I should be there, I could do it better. Your way might seem better, but how do you know they're not following direction from God? I'd certainly like to hope they are, and that just might not be what your head can wrap around. And it might not make sense to you. This is where submission and authority comes in. I've been here since, what, 2007? 11 going on 12 years. Have I agreed? I'll sit here and tell them right in front of them because they know it. Have I agreed with everything Pastor and Carol have ever done here at the church? No. You it's bet. not my church. You bet. It's my home church, right? Okay. No. But they follow direction from God. Amen. I'm under I'm in submission to them. Yes, and the sentence. Right. Now, of course, it was something that didn't line up in the word. That's a whole different story, but that's never happened. Right? Amen. right? Yeah. Why? Because service is an act of worship. Amen. Pride and offense inside the local church will cause people to leave churches, like I said, for all the wrong reasons. I could sit here for an hour and a half telling you every silly reason people have left here. And it'd blow your mind. And I want everybody to stay here and grow where they're supposed to be. Amen? Amen. And the Bible point blank tells us to free ourselves and deal with our pride. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The word haughty in Hebrew means to exalt exaltation or grandeur. We think more of ourselves than we ought. Mm -hmm. Jesus is about as humble as a God. Right. And he was God. Right. And man. Right? Yeah. If anybody had a right to, you know, but no. James chapter 4, verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You want grace in your life? Cultivate a lifestyle of true humility, not false humility. Right? Mm -hmm. Service. Uh, service is an act of worship. Amen. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the actual a word, the word pride or a form of the word pride shows up 107 times in the word of God. Guess it's pretty important. But again, my what I want to bring forth is how do we recognize this in our own lives and what's going on? So let's start, let's let's look at that. Let's look at a couple characteristics of pride. This is where we need to start checking our own hearts. Pride has an independent spirit. It's a refusal to look to God or others at time for help. You need help in your lives? And you're refusing, everybody needs help. Right? If you're refusing to ask for help, although you could use it because I don't, I, I can't let people know what I'm going through. What is that? It's a form of pride. 
right? If you need help, ask. You know, when, when Pastor started the elders situation, I was actually flabbergasted, and I don't, Anthony, you guys have been here longer than I have, but I was flabbergasted by you guys with Pastor Eddie trying to run all of this. They needed help. So what did we do? What did they do? We asked, asked for help. If you need help in your life, true help, ask. You know, don't don't bear it alone. You you were never met this walk, this Christian walk in life to do it alone. You always have Jesus, but you have your brothers and sisters here too. Ask for help. If you have an independent spirit, say, I got this. I don't need help from anybody. I don't need to do it God's way. I got this. It's a pride thing. A failure to admit mistakes. I don't like to be wrong. First person I'm going to tell you, I don't like when I make a mistake. But I'm endeavoring all the time. Because I'm a work in progress too. I'm endeavoring every time I make a mistake to own that mistake. Amen. You know what? Mistakes are one of the best things we can ever do. You're know, like, what is he talking about? <laughs> mistakes, why? Because that's how we learn to do it the right way. Right. What's, a, what's a quote from Thomas Edison? I forget the exact number. He said, I didn't, I didn't fail 17,000 times inventing the light bulb. I succeeded once. Mm -hmm. But he had to fail all those times to succeed. Mistakes will shape you, mold you, teach you, allow them to, and own them. Especially when somebody else is involved in that mistake where it affected somebody else. Do you have a rebellious attitude towards those in authority? You know, I see this a lot of times when we start to change things around in ministries. You know, we're going to change this around, but we've always done it the other way. But we're going to change this around, but we've always done it that way. Guys, we're going to change this around. A rebellious, you know, you have that rebellious spirit of, I'm just doing it my way. That's pride. Right? I don't know anybody in here who has this, but I'm going to say it anyway. A proud countenance. You've seen people that walk around, you know, little, nose a little higher. Not to be judgmental, but you know what I'm saying. You know, we got to check ourselves. I had an old sales manager. It was actually my first sales manager in business. He used to tell us when we'd answer the phones with incoming calls for sales leads, he would have a mirror in front of him. He said, put a mirror in front of your desk. And before you answer the phone, say, let me see you smile. Yeah. And then smile. And then answer the phone. Because what's on your face is what you exhibit to others. He used to tell us if you're having a bad day and you're down and you're just wanting to quit. At that time, I was selling real estate. You want to quit the real estate business? Give somebody else your phone time. You're no good to anybody. Amen. Let me see you smile. Amen. Start to worship God when you get down. You know, to go to the mall this time of the year, you better be all prayed up and all worship up on, you know, or ask Miss Carol to pray for a parking spot for you. We did that in Oklahoma. We're perfect. <laughs> but a proud countenance. Do you have self-centered conversation? And again, I'm not judging this. I'm just using this person. I'm using an example. I know somebody in particular that I stopped saying at like parties and get togethers, I stop saying, how are you doing to them? <laughs> Jody knows it's truthful. Two years, I stopped that saying, how are you doing? Somebody I was close to. Why? Because I, I couldn't take the answer. The answer went off for four hours. <laughs> how are you doing? Oh, let me tell you. And I'd be like, oh, man. Oh, you did that. Yeah. And then finally, I was just like, I started another conversation. They'd still be going. I just turned to the right and go, uh-huh. It's always about them. It's always about them. I like to talk. I have, a, I have a natural tendency to interrupt people. because Not because it's about me. I'm eager to help. But I've also learned that God gave me two ears and one mouth for a reason. I need to listen more. Listen more. We need to listen more. If it's all about us, what's going on with us, what's going on in our life, you know, especially if you're ministering to somebody. Amen. Somebody comes to you and says, Oh, you never believe what I'm going through. Oh, I went through that. Let me spend four hours telling you what I went through. Yeah. Yeah. That's not what they want to hear. They want you to listen to them. Right. And then uplift them, edify them, support them. Right? Yeah. How about an intolerance toward others' mistakes? When somebody makes a mistake that's directed at you or causes you to have an issue at work or whatever, do you encourage them? Or you bang them over the head a little bit? Jody reminded me of something I used to tell her in business and I got a hold of years ago was when somebody makes a mistake, it's a three-step three approach. 
look, I really appreciate the job you do here. You know, you're, you're, you're a highly valued employee. And then I go to, you know, but I, you know, I noticed that you've done this wrong a couple times and, you know, can we really work on that? And then come back to, but, you know, we really, really like the job you're doing. Right? Well, if that's, you know, deal with people in love when they make a mistake. Because your next mistake is right around the corner as soon as you leave that person you're talking to. Amen? Amen. Do you have a bossy attitude? You know, especially if you're in leadership in anywhere. Leaders lead from the front. We're going to talk about this in that Saturday conference we have coming up. But leaders teach. Bosses demand. Leaders teach and bosses demand. A leader always leads from the front. Do you have a bossy attitude? Do you have a need for things that you do to be recognized or seen by others? Do you want to be seen, right? Jody will tell you, I know pastors a little bit like this too. This is out of my wheelhouse. You know, you might say, well, how does that? I don't know, I can't figure it out, right? Doing this, preaching, right? Being a minister is out of my wheelhouse. It's outside my comfort zone. It's just what God's called me to do. But I actually would rather shrink away after service than anybody come up to me and say anything. Jody will tell you. It makes me a little uncomfortable. You know, I don't want to be seen. But if somebody, if, if you're the opposite and you want to be seen in everything you do, and don't get me wrong, if you're a boss, if you have, if you have people working for you, you're a leader, we have to encourage people that they're doing a good job. That's a whole different thing. But if your whole purpose to doing what you do is to be seen by others, that's a pride issue. Amen? Amen? And last but not least, here's another characteristic of pride. Are you constantly in strife with people? If you're constantly at odds with people, that's usually because you think your way is the best way and the right way, and you won't have it, you're going you're gonna to cause strife in every relationship you have. And again, when we're talking about blessing blockers, let's, let's take a look at, you guys okay for another five minutes? Amen. How do we overcome pride and offense. We talked about the characteristics. We talked about it inside the local church. But how do we overcome pride and offense? First and foremost, recognize the characteristics we just talked about. In yourself. With others, we don't have, you know what, that's on them. That's between them and God, right? In yourself. You know, cultivate a lifestyle of living in a non-judgmental zone. But Matthew chapter 7 Verse 3 says, And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Mm -hmm. Recognize those characteristics we just talked about inside yourself. Number two, always remain teachable. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 12, 1 says, Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, Amen. but he who hates correction is stupid. Amen. Nobody likes, correction doesn't always feel good, but it's awesome when you embrace it got to change. If you're not changing, you're dying. We need to be changing every day. Always remain teachable. You know, I let, it, it, it just it hurts my heart, actually, is the best way to put it. Every time we have something going on here, whether it's a workshop, you know, a conference, and people are like, I don't need that. Man, I need it. Every time the doors are open. You know, that's how me and Jody changed our life around. Every time the doors were open. You know, of course, this all starts with a personal intimate relationship with God and spending time in the Word every day. But all that extra is important. Mm -hmm. Hearing comes by the Word. It was Pastor's Mana Cafe thing this morning. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. Mm -hmm. And what's so awesome about the Word of God, everything we hear in every worship, workshop and everything we do can be applied to every area of your life. Mm -hmm. Not just ministry, not just your job, your family, yeah. others, getting people saved. Amen. Always remain teachable. Like I just said, live in a no judgment zone. Take time to get to know someone and don't make a snap decision about them like I was talking about. No predispositions. And it's not always about what you see in a person. You see them do something, that's not them. That's not necessarily them. Right? Get to know them. Right. And don't listen to what somebody else told you about them. Cultivate true humility in our lives, right? James chapter 4, verse 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. True humility, not false humility. 
Remember, pride is about our glory, and humility is about God's glory. You guys know what ego stands for? Edging God out. That's when pride takes over. I got this. Look at me. Look at what I've done. And that's all about us. And humility is about God's glory. Avoid false humility. We just talked about that with the, um, the tax collector and the Pharisee, right? Submit to authority. Huge, guys. This whole system that God put in place works by submission and authority. We know that we know the account of the centurion, right? And 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 uh, the man coming to Jesus, or the man sent to Jesus, depending on which gospel you read it out of, which are the same thing, right? Talks about submission and authority. I'm a man with authority and under authority. And what does Jesus end by saying? I have, in all of Israel have I not seen such great faith. It's all about submission and authority. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Submit to government. Uh, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And authorities that exist are appointed by God. If the world could get a hold of that, if everybody that posts anything political on Facebook could get a hold of that one scripture, they'd all shut up finally. <laughs> you don't like Trump. He's in office. God put him there. You don't like Nancy Pelosi? She might be the Speaker of the House. God put her there. It doesn't matter what we feel or think. I said something to somebody the other day. They must have thought I was radical because I was a Christian. I told them the next election, if you didn't vote, first of all, don't even talk to me about politics. Secondly is, as far as I'm concerned, we need to support the candidate that's, that exhibits the most biblical principles in what their platform is, right? Okay. It might not be from the party you think it's going to be from. It's not about parties, it's about people. Yes. We've had Democratic presidents, God put them there. Mm -hmm. We've had Republican presidents, God's put them there. Mm -hmm. oh, man, I wish people would get a hold of it. I was just tired of this on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Avoid gossip. We talked about this already. Gossip stops when it reaches one obedient mm -hmm. Christian. Okay, we're going to finish this. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. We've got two more and we're done. You guys can come up here. Let's go. Um, agree to disagree. Right. We can agree. Sometimes there's no way, you know, we could get the strife all we want. You're not going to see it my way. I'm not going to see it your way. And guess what? That's okay. Yep. Right. If the church could get a hold of this. Right. Think of the power. I heard Kenneth Copeland, it was a, it was a minister's conference. He, was, he had the Pope on video. And he was talking back and forth with the Pope. Joe, you saw this, right? Mm -hmm. And he goes... Uh, he goes, if we could just, and the Pope said this to, to, to Kenneth Copeland, he said, if we could just all get together on what we do agree on, mm -hmm. and stop majoring in the minors about the stuff that we don't agree on, that would be a revival would break out all over the world. Live in harmony with one another. No strife. Once we get in strife and bickering, infighting inside the church, we're no good for anybody. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. That should be what we're striving for as the church. To be of one accord. What happened in the upper room? When the Holy Spirit came, they were in what? One accord. We need to be in one accord. And lastly, cultivate an attitude where our love from G of Jesus outweigh our love of self. That will get pride and offense out of your life. Cultivate an attitude where our love of Jesus must outweigh our love of self. Remember, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Are you willing to do the same thing? If you are, then pride and offense is a problem for you. If you're not, that's okay too. Because thank God he gave us 1 John 1, 9. Lord, I missed it in this area. Forgive me, I'm going to do it your way. Amen? Amen. Hope you guys got something. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for an opportunity to be here tonight. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that it's alive, sharper than any two-edged sword, and points our hearts in a direction that we need to change, Lord. And we thank you that you are the change facilitator, Father. And as each one of us endeavors to put into practice what we heard tonight, Lord, we thank you that true change will happen. We thank you for everything you've done tonight. And we thank you for everything 
In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Ones that need it weren't here. Right? <laughs>